you get into an eighth grader's head to try to tell her story, especially in the age of social media now? Well, it was because of probably that age where it was like you just, um, if you want to learn anything about these kids' life, they're posting everything about themselves online. So it really was like research, just watching hundreds of hours of videos of, of young kids vlogging or looking at their presence online. It was really just trying to do justice to the stories they were already telling on these other mediums. And what did you see in Elsie Fisher that made you say she's the one? She um she was the only she was the only person that sort of played the character actively. Everyone else, every other young actor, there were a lot of talented young actors, but they all played it sort of passive. They thought of Shy as cowering in the corner rather than Shy as wanting to speak and not being able to. It's the classic sort of um, don't play the obstacle thing for an actor, where she understood that Kayla is someone that is wanting something and not not backing away from the world. Yeah. Uh, one of the scenes that most impressed me from a directorial standpoint was when Kaylee is pacing mm -hmm. and you're following her and we're really feeling the anxiety. Yeah. How for you did that translate from the time you rigid on the script to when you actually directed it for the screen? Yeah, I mean, that's I pace on the phone. I mean, that's something I do. I pace a lot on the phone. I pace a lot in general and people will like just see me outside a hotel or something. And the people, like random people on the street, will come and go, like, "Are you okay?" They think I'm having like a mental breakdown or something. Um, and yeah, that was. Uh, but it the visual, the, visually, it was sort of the idea of that really long lens following her, so it's a little bit more chaotic. Was more on the day, or, or I can't quite remember. That's sort of like Cassavetti's shot or whatever. Um, but yeah, it, it was more. I mean, the real person that that conveys it is Elsie. Elsie really does convey the all the sort of excited terror of, of that moment. Um, yeah, that's one of my favorite scenes. Well, thank you so much for talking with us. Well, we always have the same first question. What, what was the inspiration to want to do, tell this story? Well, um, it, it's a great story. It's got an unbelievable story, right? So you, uh, you really wanted to kind of find kind of more the way to tell the story was the big, was the big thing. You know, it was a story that obviously, you know, should be told, but the, the key thing was how, how you're going to tell it, right? So, because um, it's so unbelievable, you almost have to make it believable, right. <laughs> you know? And, and so, uh, so that, was, that was kind of our big challenge, I think, was to really, you know, um, kind of reveal the absurdity of hate, you know? And, and that's why I think where a lot of the humor comes from in the film is, is that we don't really tell jokes, it's really just kind of revealing kind of how how crazy, insane hate really is, and um, and then just really trying to find the the characters and the personalities that really shape kind of the rest of the film. It must have been challenging trying to write two uh, two characters, the same character from different points of view, <laughs> yeah. Brad and Driver and John D. Watch the play. How was that process like trying to get in their heads separately while writing? Well, I think when we kind of figured out um, that you know the, the real Ron Stallworth is really. You know, his, his, his problem is that he's black and he's blue. And, uh, and the white Ron Stallworth is, his problem is that he's, he's white and he's Jewish. And, and both of them are, are kind of wrestling with what I call Tunis, what W.B. Du Bois called Tunis. Uh, and, and a lot of characters are kind of dealing with that in the film. I mean, Patrice's character is kind of dealing with, with Tunis as well. She's black um, and she'd like to believe in America, but it's hard for her to believe in it. It's hard for her to believe in the police. It's hard for her to believe in the things that Ron kind of does try to believe in. And so that's kind of the nature of their conflict in a lot of ways. And so um, those are the kind of ideas that we tried to really kind of, you know, you know, expose and capitalize and to kind of try to reveal to the audience. Was there any uh, d d uh, challenge in trying to balance the comedy and the drama so it wouldn't be like too funny or too serious at a certain time? Sure. Well, you know, what we, what we try to do, what Spike and I try to do is really, um, we never tell jokes. We, you know, by, by revealing kind of the absurdity of hate, that's where the humor comes from. And so we let that kind of you know, do its own thing in a sense. So if it's funny, great. If it's not funny, well, okay. <laughs> you know, but but um, but we don't try to make the audience laugh. Hopefully, just how insane hate is, it's it's pretty funny. Now it must be a lot of times the writer doesn't even work with the director or have any involvement. How is it knowing that he was directing as a co-writer, be able to give you more press freedom to write the script? Sure. Well, we worked together on, on Shy Rack as well, and. Um, you know, uh, Spike and I kind of have a, a great relationship, I think, in terms of trust and kind of understanding where each other's coming from. And 
So um, that was, I think, a large part of it. You know, he, he kind of let me do my thing, and then I would send him a draft, and then he would read it and send me his draft. We'd kind of go back and forth like that. So quite, uh, one question following up to that. What was the most challenging seeing the right in the Black Klansman? Well, you know, probably the whole third act was, was, was challenging. You know, they're, it, they're, you know, Ron did a really good job as a policeman, and he was able to, to stop all the terrorist attacks that were really happening. So in a movie, you kind of you kind of need that <laughs> in a weird way, you know. So um, so you know we had to kind of you know fictionalize a few things that were in the spirit of what really did happen, and so it was really designing all of that. You know, was I think was for me was the big challenge. How fun was the scene at the end where they're calling David Duke back, and the cops are kind of having some fun? Well, you know, David Duke called Ron uh, after the premiere of the film. Oh. And uh, and asked him how his, how he was portrayed in the film, so uh, you know it's like you're a Klansman. How, how do you think you're portrayed in the film? <laughs> so so uh, you know I mean it's it's just stranger than fiction. I mean it's just the more unbelievable it is, the more it really is. Now obviously the the the, the movie the end scene is heartbreaking, moving, but you, you know there was some rights issues like you weren't sure you're gonna do it. What was how would the ending have been different if you were not able to do that ending? Well, the reason the reason we, we used the Charlottesville footage uh, was the, the original ending was they move, you know, that shot where they move toward the window and you see the cross, cross burning in the distance. And the idea was that um, the, the problem continues. And then when Charlottesville happened, it was the best example of the problem continuing. So that's that's really Donald Trump and, and David Duke kind of wrote themselves into the film. So it was really just embracing the reality of our lives right now as Americans and and putting that in the film. You had to find some humanity in David Duke to play the character, you know, it, 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 so how did you approach him? Uh, you know, I was looking for that because they say you have to find uh, some something that, you, you know, if you're playing the Joker or some fictional character, you have to see, well, I'll make up a thing that the audience won't know, but I'll know that keeps him human, gives me a way in, and the more research I did, on David, the uh, less I liked him. So uh, I just tried to cover a lot. I don't know, man. I did like a month and a half of research, and uh, it was the worst time of my life. It was just like, um, you know, I read his book, which is kind of like his Mein Kampf, and I read, uh, I watched a lot of uh, filmed interviews with him. And the best was actually he did, uh, I mean, this is terrible, but it was good for my research. He did. Uh, a couple episodes of Donahue in the early 80s. And I saw how he was with the crowd, which is, they were booing him when he came out. And he didn't, he didn't flip them, I mean, they weren't cheering for him, but he, he changed the, the temperature in the room. And I really went, oh, that's what makes him so evil. And then he ran for politics a couple of years later. It probably wasn't a surprise. How did Spike help you? Because you obviously say some horrible things in the movie. You, you know, the character's a horrible thing. What was the approach to Spike saying, you know, how are you gonna do it on set? Well, Spike's one of the great directors of all time, and uh, there honestly isn't anyone I would have felt comfortable doing it with except for him. So it was like an easy decision. But, what, but knowing he was going to be at the helm, he was already directing it when I read it. I felt totally at ease, and uh, I knew that he would get... It's a really tricky tone. And very few people can get it, and, and I knew he'd get it. Oh, so what was the inspiration to why you tell this story? Um, it was our love of uh, silent filmmakers like Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton and Jacques Tati who were doing these incredible films where you didn't have to say a word to understand what the emotion was, what the plot was. So we really wanted to see if we could do that in a modern day context and combine our love of Alien and Jaws and The Man Who Knew Too Much and Hitchcock's brilliant suspense work. Uh, what was the biggest challenge cutting off the biggest screenwriting tool? dialogue. <laughs> it was a huge challenge. We were so self-conscious when we started writing the script. We're like, how is anyone going to be able to read this script, first of all? Because there's no dialogue, there's a lot of blocks of words on the page, and how are we going to communicate our vision? So we threw out all the rules, and we used pictures and diagrams, and we used, we played with the words and font sizes to make it basically just communicate that this is going to be a pure cinema experience, unlike anything you've ever seen. That was the idea. All right, so generally, how long did it take you to write it? I mean, this was first and foremost an idea that was cooking in the back background of our brains for like a decade. But 
that was one of those things where we were self-conscious. We weren't sure, did anyone want to make this movie? And we just filed in a drawer for the longest time. But once we finally had the confidence and had a few people that believed in this idea behind us, it was like three to four months to actually write that first draft. So we were really hungry to, to just get it done. So then what was the biggest challenge you found in the draft itself when you actually got to that three or four month challenge? I, think, I would say making sure that this was an emotional journey and not just a scary movie and not just something that felt like a gimmick, but that it had this emotional arc throughout it that hopefully by the end of the film you're feeling more than just scared. It's feeling some sort of emotion for, for the father and the daughter specifically. So. completely agree. And when we talked about the rules of the monster, we were almost always talking about how does it connect to the metaphor of broken communication and um, protecting your family? Because it's uh, it's one thing to just have a scary monster, but we really wanted people to be moved by the experience and have it mean something to them beyond what, what the action of the film is. And our final question is, uh, when you planted the nail, how fun was it watching the audience wait for it? That was one of those incredible payoffs. I mean, that was one of those, that nail we, we put in the script, not knowing how exactly it would pay off, but about, you know, page 50, that's where we discovered, that's where you have her step on it. So to see that with a full audience at South by Southwest and have them react was one of the most satisfying moments of our career. So. All right, so what, what actually drew you to want to tell the, uh, retell this story? Well, I was asked to. Bradley Cooper came to me and said, we don't feel it's exactly the movie we want to make, and uh, Warner Brothers wants to see how we could figure it out it w that it would be. And so I just I said, let's dig in, and let's dig in and um, do a few weeks of outline and start, you know, not from scratch per se, but utilize some things you have and and let's see where it grows on you. And, and, you know, and Bradley and I worked on it like dogs, you know. Yeah. Now, you actually have two characters going in different trajectories. How did you approach balancing, making sure each storyline had equal weight and didn't overshadow the other one? Um, I think that just sort of comes with the territory of the, of the, of the piece. And uh, as long as you can have them find some intimacy and uh, what they love about each other. And also, I think there is a, a built-in realization, which I was talking about someone else about, Love stories have to have a, uh, not an unhappy ending, but a, a, an ending, a bittersweet ending where people don't get to get together. That's sort of the famous thing about love stories. And I think he sort of felt that with from the, from the moment they met in this kind of crazy way they met, that this was, you know, so sort of moment a moment time, you know. And uh, so. Our last question, is the 25th anniversary of Forrest Gump? <laughs> so how, how, is that, how is that looking back? Uh, Oh, it was just the most amazing experience, you know? How can you, uh, it was like uh, mana from heaven in some way. It just, uh, it also proved to me you can, um, you can be as original as you can be, you know? Yeah, it was pretty amazing. Yeah. What drew you to want to uh, retell this story in, in updating for more of a modern audience? Uh, you know, two things really jumped out when I first read the draft, because I didn't know about the other movies. Um, and I was interested in the intersection of art and commerce, because I was early in my career. I had just gotten a big studio job at Warner Brothers. It was a Nick Sparks movie, but it was big to me. Um, and I just delivered the draft. And so I was in a place where agents and studio executives suddenly were, you go from not getting anyone even knowing who you are to a bunch of opportunities, and you have to be able to kind of sift through them and stay true to yourself. And I lost myself early in my career. And this, this was a chance to kind of to kind of work through some of that. Like what happens when you get into a system and the system starts to ask things of you, it can be really difficult to hold on to, to, to your, your own voice as an artist. So that was one thing. And then just being, you know, being completely and thoroughly honest about uh, Jackson Maine's alcoholism and depression. I mean, just having an opportunity to try to tell a story that, that gets at the core of, of kind of a, a pretty deep sadness that, that he's unable to overcome. And I think it's something that I, you know, I've, I've had experience with it in my own life, and it was some, important to me to try to have a way to work that out. How do you balance, because they both have, obviously their storylines are integrated, but they're also separate. They have their own arcs. How do you balance making sure one storyline doesn't overshadow the other one? I mean, that, that is, it is difficult. I think one of the, the decisions we made early that made that a lot easier was in the other versions of the movie, you know, Jack, uh, the Jack Maine character, who's Norman Maine and others, is, is much more um, self-centered. I mean, Jack is self-centered in his own ways, but it's, again, it comes more from like a narcissistic, like his depression is part of what feeds that. But the idea that he is just fully and totally supportive of her and concerned with her always, it made it a lot easier because 
even when you're just with Jack, he's thinking about her or missing her. So it's like it really kind of kept the story. Their love story is the main character in that story. That is in every scene. So it's kind of like allowed the movie to just feel you're never really worried about screen time. It's just about what felt honest to, to how their, their lives were together. And how was it having Lady Gaga say your lines? Like having somebody who actually understands the music business be able to relate to your character. I mean, the lines would are way more honest because of her. She was collaborating with us from the beginning. She was willing to give us access to and be honest and open about her own life and her own experiences. And, you know, Bradley and I were able, I was able to, we had Bradley available to kind of to, to talk about what it's like to be famous and to live inside of that bubble and, and to, to be in these big, loud environments like this and suddenly in like a quiet car. But accessing what it's like to be a young woman in the music yeah. industry is not a place either of us had access to. And even though Bradley has a ton of you know, friends in the music business, she, her presence opened up that character in a way that no one else could. And, um, and I will miss being able to just write, she sings. That's going to be something I miss. All right, so let's go. What drew you to this story of all uh, you know the wonderful novels he's written? Uh, you know, this one I love because it was a blend of his two voices. You know, it was both a romance, but also something that was socially conscious and politically relevant. And uh, you obviously yeah, it's an ensemble piece. What are the challenges in writing a script, giving each storyline, balancing the storylines, making sure one doesn't you know get shortchanged? Really? Yeah, I think the key is really to choose a point of view. You know, and for me with this uh, with this adaptation, you know, understanding that the the book is James Baldwin's point of view. But the film was our main character, Tisha's point of view. At that point, then, the other characters, as they relate to her life, they deserve screen time. And so it was really just about focusing in and understanding that we were telling Tisha's story and no one else's. All right, so you wrote a brilliant script. What was about Regina's performance that really surprised you? Uh, not surprising, because I know she's capable of so many things. But, you know, I think just in, as a director, sometimes you, you know, the actor is working for you. But I, I like it when an actor is working with you. And in this case, Regina was working with us. And so there were so many places where, especially going from literature to cinema, mm. I was trying to find the simplest images to translate, you know, the really evocative prose of James Baldwin. And just sometimes hanging on Regina's face was enough to communicate all these things that Mr. Baldwin is writing about. So really wonderful actress to work with, the perfect person for this part. Well, Reaction when you first your your emotional reaction to reading the Green Book script the first time? I cried. This is the first script in my life that I read, and I read a lot of theater scripts. I was a thespian for a long time in Europe and here. This is the first time I read a script that makes me cry, and the only reason it's not the story per se. It was what the story tells you. The hope that hope that it happened, it was real. And here we are, what, 50 years later, still the same? And that was the biggest thing of this script. The hand reaching across, absolute opposites, worst circumstances you can imagine. But they listen, not only they hear each other. So that was the greatest of the whole script. And what drew you to your character? What was the impetus that made you want to play that character? Um, I want to play every character, but this particular character, I was familiar with the character before from old country. I come from the communist Bulgaria, and we study Yuri Tacht, which is the original prototype of the character of Oleg, who was this genius cello player, graduated St. Petersburg, now Leningrad back then, conservatory, during the Khrushchev days. And we study him as a bad guy defector, enemy of the state. He went to America to play jazz. No, no, no. So being him, as much as we were so close, I'm a classical violinist trained in the same system of the communism. I came to America to play jazz. I defected here. And all those similarities, it was in a way opportunity for me to tell people who we were back then how we were brought up. And if you follow the film, you will see Oleg doesn't get angry. He doesn't get upset. He doesn't solve a problem emotionally. What he's trying to do is reach into the mind, into the heart, and give that courage so Tony can change. Actually, actors, what was your initial reaction the first time you read the script? I thought it was great. I know the writer, though. But I, you know, when I got the script, I didn't realize he was the writer, you know, and, and I was a close friend, 
or, you know, I, I've known her for many years, and I knew the real Tony Lip. So I just thought it was really terrific. And it was a fun movie to make. Peter Farley just did a brilliant job directing it. And the screenplay, to me, is seamless. And what about your character? What drew you to your character? Well, it wasn't a lot, you know, and it was originally written for Frank's a true story about Sinatra. Oh. Sinatra really went into the code, but that's how him and Tony Lip became friends. So when I went there, they said, that we want to see me, and um, Rick Montgomery, the casting person, said, that they want you to read for Sinatra. And I went, I said, are you nuts? I got a lot in my wheelhouse, brother. But I ain't going after that. <laughs> he said, no, 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 we're going to change it. We're going to make him like a captain in Lucchese or Genovese crime family. And I said, okay. And uh, I mean, I liked the character because he kind of opens the movie. And, you know, it was a nice couple of little scenes. And I'm grateful to be in such an important movie, which I think is important. And how has the review? The fan reaction has been wonderful to the film. Yeah, it's been overwhelming. I never expected it. I mean, I was in Toronto the first time they screened it in September, and 2,000 people stood up and applauded. I would never experienced that before. All right, so uh, writing for The Simpsons, um, how freeing is it for you to write on an animated show that allows you to push any boundary you want? I'd love it. I have to say, because you know, in animation, you really can do anything, and um, we do have a year. You know, from start to finish, it takes us a year to write an episode. So many times during the process, we can change things. So you start off, and you may have one idea in the first draft, and then it changes at the table read. So we have a long time to play with it, and that's the beauty of it. So by the time the year is up, the episode is usually where you want it to be. Yeah. Now, obviously, Bar Bart is dead. Uh, Bart is dead. <laughs> Now, you're messing with Christian filmmakers and stuff like that. What was the approach to this episode? So, this is the thing. Um, the Christian movies have been very popular, and so we thought it was time to satire them. And um, I think that Bard is the kind of guy who might make up a fib to get out of a problem, maybe, with a little help from Homer. And uh, it was a really fun episode to write because um, I love to write the musical numbers. And Jonathan Groff was one of the singers, and Emily Deschanel. And then we had a lot of fun co-stars. It was like Pete Holmes and David Tell. And as far as stand-ups, I just adore them. And uh, it was just a really, really great episode. And it was, um, I don't know, one of my favorite to write. Now, working on a show like this, are you concerned about it someday losing its legs? Because I think it's been on one or two seasons? It's been on 30 years! <laughs> um, Listen, I've been there 14 years, so I have to say this, as you can tell, I'm still excited. Yeah. So there's so much going on in the news, there's so much going on in the world, and whether it is things that are difficult for us right now, the, the good part about it as writers is we can satire it, and we can make fun of it, and this too will pass. And so right now, I think there's just so much to satire, so it's very, very, it's, it's a rich time to be a writer. Yeah. you being able to write uh, in this kind of blended genre? Kind of, does it free up a little more as a writer? Well, I don't even think about it in terms of genre. You just try to find the story and, 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 and do the story, you know, and not think about it too much in terms of the genre aspect of it. You just try to find a character and an emotion and follow that, you know, and then it's always kind of a dance between emotion and logic and also just trying to keep the, the story moving. You know, give it some sort of narrative propulsion to it. And Alec Berg is is uh, my co-writer is uh, an amazing. Uh, he taught me how to do that, and we're we're kind of. It's the hardest. If you're trying to be a screenwriter, just know you're trying to do the hardest uh, part of the process. You're doing the. I can tell you, I've done. I've been through it all now, <laughs> and and the hardest uh, mentally, the hardest part is 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 writing. You know, is is starting with nothing and trying to build something because it can be very deceptive that you have it. Like, oh, I got it. And then you look at it again, you go, wait, no, I don't. This is terrible, you know? And then you try to find little things. But then if you do it too much, you can go into an area that makes no sense. And then you go, no, no, no back up, back up. So um, it's good to have a good co-writer. It's good to be uh, self-disciplined to kind of look at the stuff to make sure it's making sense or not, you know? So I hope, I hope that made sense. No, right. All 
All right, so you write a, a show about news parody of you know 24 hour news, but the 24 hour news has become a parody in itself. What are the challenges of kind of telling that kind of story and keeping it fresh comedically? Well, it's true. The news itself is is insane, and and I think what we tried to do was was not just look at the content of the news because that's so horrifying and and depressing, but to look at the news itself and how CNN, how Fox News, how these different places are actually covering things, and that became our touchstone for. Uh, or our lodestar, if you will, for wh where we jumped off from. So also a jumping off point, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, it, it feels like the mis our mission was not to kind of outdo the real world, but to get a, kind of at it sideways to highlight what the things that people have kind of forgotten that they should be noticing, maybe. And our last question, what is, so, what is special about this writer's room as a team compared to the writer's you've been associated with? Uh, this writer's room is Awesome. It's this truly the, one of the greatest rooms you could ever. It's a, it's a rock star team of hilarious people, people who are also good people. There's really good hearts in this room, and, and it's, it's just a lot of fun, and I'm so damn proud of the work. All right, so what was the biggest challenge for you trying to find the humanity in a character that, you know, some of us liberals might not love? Uh, well, my uh, kind of premise was that no one's born evil, that we all find a way to where we end up. And part of the reason I wanted to make this movie was to understand how did Dick Cheney get to this point. And I was surprised. What I found was a, a guy a lot like us who went through a process of ambition and incentivization that uh, may have lured a lot of us into uh, the decisions that he made. How did Christian get into his psyche? Because obviously the physical thing was amazing, but I was impressed how he got into his psyche. Well, that was part of it. I mean, he looked at like who he loved. He looked at who his friends were. I mean, it, think about what makes you you, what makes me me, like the people around us who responds. And it was uh, some of the most incredibly nuanced acting I've ever seen. Christian Bale, what he did, I think it's a performance for a generation. So we're going to go back a little memory lane to early collaboration Ron Howard, Night Shift, yes. who we had the honor of actually interviewing Henry Winkler a few years ago. Uh, where, where did that come from? Came from, uh, from Brian Grazer, the producer. He, he uh, s somehow he came across this. An article in the paper. It was this big. Right. I saw it. Brian saw it. And I remember. In, in the New York Daily News, it said two knuckleheads had been arrested for trying to run a call girl service out of the city morgue. And this was the early 80s, so that, that kind of uh, comedy was, uh, was really popular, you know, it was, it was Animal House and Porky's and that kind of thing. And, and uh, you know, Ron wanted to do a studio movie and he wanted to do something that didn't look like uh, it had been directed by Opie, you know, <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, so he just, they thought this would be great for him. And at that time we weren't quite a team yet, but they, they brought it to me, and I'd never written a movie. I'd been working in TV at that point for about nine, ten years, and I said, "Well, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to do this alone. I don't, I don't possess that kind of confidence." Yeah, where do you put places for commercials? <laughs> <laughs> and, and Bob Lou had been working on the same writing, TV writing staffs that I had been on, and uh, I, I knew he always wanted to write movies, so I just called him up and I said. This could be your chance if you if you'll throw in with me on this. You know, we, we could we could the, these two these two guys think think I can do this. <laughs> I think you can do it. <laughs> Let's see if anybody's right. Uh, so that's that's how we did it. And how did working on those great TV shows uh, actually prepare you? You think for the future writing? Completely. Uh, I, Absolutely. You we we did, you know this is the days before you know like really really first rate writing courses, you know, not that we would have gotten through them anyway, because we were not good students, but, but, but you know, TV was, it's so accelerated, just the sheer quantity of what you're called upon to write, 24 episodes a season, actors needing new lines and new scenes hour by hour by hour on the set because they don't like what was written for them this morning and they want a new script in the afternoon and you just write and you write and you write and and of course you know i got to work for years under the mentorship of gary marshall and you know at least when i watching gary i was go oh oh okay 
that's what I'm supposed to be trying to do. So it gave me at least like a, 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 a vision of what to, what to kind of, how to try to engage in, 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 the, in the craft. Now, obviously you've collaborated with Ron Howard, Splash, and so many others. What has been special about working with Ron Howard as a director? You know, Ron broke us into the business the right way. He was so open. We got to, we got to participate in everything. He was, he was in no way, like, jealous of his domain or anything like that. Even in the editing room. Yeah. Even in the editing room. Yes. In, yeah. And in fact, he's so, he was so protective of the right. Lowell and I would go, oh, you got to, please, Ron, you got to cut it. But you wrote it. You go, it's not, good. look, it's not, we don't, it's not our best. Stuff. Yeah, come on. There's four jokes in that scene better than this one, you know, and he would say, but he would take the point of pride and go, no, it's a good joke. I, I can cut it differently. I can make it work, you know, and, and he, and we would just go, no, please, I don't ever want to hear that joke again. It's making me sad, you know, but, uh. Uh, no, he and Brian, and, and that's followed through with so many people we worked through, Billy Crystal and Penny and, and, and the Farrelly brothers. Even the brothers. Even the Farrelly brothers. Yeah, yeah, they, they were One fantastic. One of the best experiences we had was working on a movie called yeah. Fever Pitch. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah and, and, and Harold Ramis, and, Harold and just, Ramis, yes. just wonderful people who are also really talented and really just generous about what they... Smart. Yeah, Smart. you know, just people like that, they don't... They don't get tense about the fact, oh the, oh, the writers are on the set. Oh, they're going to give me a hard time because I don't like the way I, you know, whatever. Yeah. Not, not, certainly not Ron. And, and, you know, like Parenthood, which is probably our best picture. He had such command over that material. I, I mean, it was just, uh, it, it just, he, he made it music, you know. It, it, was, he's, it was fantastic.